This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Some of the turning points of history just happen. Volcanoes erupt. Earthquakes, floods and fires destroy cities. But most of the turning points of history do not just happen. This was their final power. They are the result of actions taken by people. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Fear itself. They are the work of those who use power, ambition, belief to shape events. People are the authors of history. It's the curious thing about history that we all understand the great currents matter. The institutions matter, geography matters, economics matters, what natural resources you have matters. But I do think there are moments in history when it really matters who's in power. This is the story of the people who, holding or reaching for power, shaped our world. The titans of the 20th century. This fast-moving war would not be the static war of the First World War. They'd use motorcycles, they'd use trucks, use armored vehicles. They'd use aircraft in support of troops like a flying sort of artillery. And so I think from the German point of view, what they were really concentrating on was a continental war. And what they hoped, really right up until 1940, was that the British would come to their senses. Whether making peace with a rampant Adolf Hitler would have been sensible is not a question that the British public was ever asked. Their government, their prime minister, said that at last they had come to their senses and they would never surrender. At the start of 1941, Britain stood alone. By the end of the year, she would be part of a grand alliance, fighting a world war. On January 6th, 1941, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt delivered his State of the Union message, unveiling his scheme for getting around the restrictions of the American Neutrality Acts, though he did not explain it in those terms. We shall send in ever-increasing numbers ships, planes, tanks, guns. That is our purpose and our pledge. He recommended a scheme called Lend-Lease in what history remembers as his Four Freedom speech. And then when he references Lend-Lease and asks for this appropriation, he sort of rhetorically asks at the end, why should we do this? And that's when he famously said, you know, in future days which we seek to make secure, and we look forward to a world founded on four fundamental human freedoms. Freedom of speech and expression, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Freedom means the supremacy of human rights everywhere. Our support goes to those who struggle to gain those rights and keep them. With that high concept, there can be no end save victory. If you love history, then you'll love History Hit. Our extensive library of documentary features everything from the ancient origins of our earliest ancestors to the daring mission to sink the Bismarck. History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. The United States would become the arsenal of democracy, providing the Grand Coalition with 75% of its war material. It was said that by 1943, 
the USA was producing a tank every five minutes, an aeroplane every half hour, and an aircraft carrier every week. Churchill called it the most unsorted act in history, and in a sense it was. The United States during the war used Lend-Lease to impose a lot of policies on the United Kingdom that were very hurtful. Lend-Lease, as far as I'm concerned, was for the United States a weapon, a real weapon, to try to replace the pound with the dollar and replace Britain as the major financial power in the world. And of course, it worked. On February 9th, Winston Churchill broadcast a speech that has also found a place in the history books. When he addressed the President of the United States, Churchill asked his radio audience, what should he say? In your name, to this great man, the thrice chosen head of a nation of 130 millions. Churchill was sometimes compared to a big gun who had an awful lot of firepower, but wasn't very maneuverable. He was very good at the prepared set oration, but he wasn't particularly good at being spontaneous. And this is what he told his listeners he would say. We shall not fail or falter. We shall not weaken or tire. Give us the tools and we will finish the job. On June 22nd, Hitler unleashed his true purpose when the largest military operation in history invaded the Soviet Union. Stalin eliminated millions of Russians for no rational reason but his paranoia. That he should trust Hitler is one of the more bizarre acts in all of human history. Stalin refuses to believe that this is being orchestrated by Hitler. He even says Hitler cannot know about this, which just goes to show the extent of the delusion under which Stalin is operating. Stalin had disregarded over 80 warnings about Operation Barbarossa, including one from the anti-Nazi German ambassador to Moscow. What Stalin did first in 1941, he brought together a combination of ideology and patriotism and compulsion. And the three together proved impossible for Hitler to defeat. Stalin begins to assume the position of war leader and commander of the response to the invasion. He is the supreme commander of the Soviet armed forces, he is people's commissar for defense, and he is head of the state defense council. All roads lead to Stalin. Between June and December 1941, for every dead German, there was 20 Soviets. The invasion sent hundreds of thousands into captivity, where most would die as prisoners of war. The Holocaust will begin in the summer of 1941, although that is not part of the Barbarossa plan, but it will rapidly become a component. There will be slave labor, there will also be mass atrocities, starvation. This is part and parcel of German planning for the invasion. City after city fell, but one daunting fact remained. 97% of the Soviet Union was still unoccupied and Stalin steadied. So as the war went on, Stalin gave more space to his leaders and, and became better. Uh, Hitler did the opposite. As early as July 16th, 1941, Hitler told a meeting that we shall never withdraw from these areas. And so, total victory or total surrender was the only possible end game. The German forces necessary to facilitate the victory at Kiev are already very hard pressed. They're encircling the Soviet Southwestern Front with a handful of panzer divisions. In Guderian's case, and he's doing most of the work, are down to 50% of their strength. This is a victory the Germans should never have won. 
The eastern continent lies like a limp virgin in the mighty arms of the German Mars, said Joseph Goebbels. Hitler saw it differently. By August 11th, he was writing, the whole situation makes it increasingly plain that we have underestimated the Russian colossus. On June 28th, still neutral but not insensitive to what was happening in the world, President Roosevelt established the Office of Scientific Research and Development. The scientific work it would coordinate included development of the atom bomb. A month later, on July 26th, two days after Japan had occupied French Indochina, Roosevelt embargoed oil, gas, and metal shipments to Japan. The United States at that point, along with the Allies, was really focused on the economic isolation of Japan. ですから、その戦争になった時に日本の弱点は資源がないということですから。1940年にドイツがフランス、オランダを降伏させるとオランダ、フランスがアジアに持っていた植民地が空いてしまいました。あの南の方に進んで石油などの資源をあらかじめ
The following day, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. この犬飼内閣の崩壊によって戦前における日本の政党政治というのがですねもう途絶えてしまいましたつまりあの国民の怒りはですねあの政党政治に向いていたんですねその経済恐慌によるその被害というのを食い止められない政党政治に対して多くの国民がまあ怒っていたですから意外にですねその暗殺した人たちに対して国民は同情的だったんです In the immediate aftermath of Pearl Harbor, American recruiting officers had to remain open throughout the night. On December 8th, Congress voted 470 to 1. In favor of war. Churchill went to bed and he said he slept the sleep of the saved. He must have had great difficulty suppressing his joy at the fact that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. The United States was now in the war. Churchill had no doubt about the effect of American power weighing in. Hitler's fate was sealed, he wrote. Mussolini's fate was sealed. As for the Japanese, they would be ground to powder. In 1941, the USA had the largest navy in the world. But her army was ranked 18th and numbered 100,000. By 1945, 100,000 had become. 14.9 million Americans in uniform. When Hitler declared war on the United States, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote in her My Day column Now we know where we are. No one in this country will doubt the ultimate outcome. Roosevelt's birthday greeting to Churchill on January 30th, 1942 said, It is fun to be in the same decade with you. But it was not fun for Churchill. On February 15th, in one of the great catastrophes in the history of Imperial Britain, Singapore surrendered to the Japanese. The sound of the causeway being taken by the Japanese. Was said by a future Prime Minister of Singapore who heard it then as a schoolboy to be the sound of the collapse of the British Empire. And in a sense, that's right. Admiral Yamamoto, Commander in Chief of the Combined Fleet, said In the first six to twelve months of a war with the United States and Britain, I will run wild and win victory after victory. After that, I have no expectation of success. That too was right. 日本海軍っていうのは、アメリカに対して戦うようにずっと訓練してきますけれども、しているんですけど、イギリスとアメリカが一緒になって敵になるっていうことは想定していないんです。ですから、それを天皇はよく知ってますから、イギリスとアメリカを同時に敵に回すような戦争については。非常に心配しました最初の作戦が非常にうまくいったので喜びましたコロニアリズムエンパー only seemed tolerable to its subjects if they couldn't see any alternative if they assumed it was the natural order while for the British this went out of the window when Malaya fell to the Japanese and Burma fell to the Japanese in 1941-42 Burma had been part of the British Empire since Churchill's father, Lord Randolph, as Secretary of State for India, had annexed it in 1886 when Winston was 12 years old. Eric Blair served as a colonial officer in Burma before returning to England, where he wrote under the name George Orwell. And as Orwell, he wrote that without the empire, 
Britain would be a cold and unimportant little island where we should all have to work very hard and live mainly on herring and potatoes. Churchill possibly felt the same. He's almost heartbroken after the collapse of Singapore. He said, we had so many men. He said they should have done better. And he saw it as a sort of terrible failure of morale, of military strength, courage, endurance. It was a symbol, really, of the fact that the British Empire in the Far East was rotten and it could be taken by a people that Churchill had been apt to despise. He called the Japanese the Wops of the Far East. After Singapore's surrender, with the Japanese in Burma and threatening India, shoring up Indian support became a priority. The Allies, particularly FDR, comes up with a plan to send Chiang Kai-shek and Madame Chang to India on a mission to reach out to Indian independence leaders. On February 18th, Chiang Kai-shek and Madame Chang met Gandhi outside Kolkata. They developed a very warm relationship very quickly with people while they were in India. The warm relationship did not translate into unconditional support. When, in March, Churchill sent Sir Stafford Cripps to India to offer dominion status after the war, he was rebuffed. The original Quit India resolution suggested that the Indians would only offer nonviolent resistance to the Axis. Nehru did not think that went anywhere near far enough. So he offered his own version. As soon as the resolution passed, because it also called for the independence of India, all of them were put in prison. Dwight Eisenhower had been sent to Europe at the end of April to command US troops. He arrived in London in May. He was 51. He wrote to his wife, Mamie, what a boon peace will be to this poor old world. In the Pacific War, the decisive Battle of Midway took place in early June. And on July 2nd, Churchill faced a no-confidence motion in the House of Commons, following the fall of the crucial port of Tobruk in North Africa. The motion was defeated by a margin that reflects the level of Churchill's support as war leader. 475 to 25. In mid-August, Churchill flew to meet Stalin in Moscow, an experience that cannot be compared to flying today. Arduous, oxygen-masked, desperately uncomfortable and dangerous. Churchill went to Moscow first in 1942 to meet Stalin and to tell him that there would be no second front that year. He said it was like taking a block of ice to the North Pole. Whatever our suffering, whatever our toils, we will continue hand in hand like comrades and brothers until every vestige of the Nazi regime has been beaten into the ground. There was Churchill with his passion, with his rhetoric, with his talk. He believed that he could convince Stalin by the force of his own personality. Stalin was absolutely vile to him. Churchill got in a terrible temper and said no, he was going to leave. Stalin, of course, was bugging his stature and knew exactly what he was saying, then made overtures to him. And their final night, they both drank huge buckets of champagne and they had a sort of rapport. Churchill promised Stalin that they would have a second front in 1943. Stalin was going to be disappointed. On August 23rd, barely a week after Churchill flew back to London, the German Sixth Army, the largest single formation in the Wehrmacht, reached the River Volga north of Stalingrad. On September the 2nd, Hitler ordered that when the city fell, the entire male population was to be eliminated. 
Once the U.S. entered the war, Eleanor Roosevelt went to bases all over the world. She always said, courage can be as contagious as fear. In September, FDR sent Mrs. Roosevelt to visit American troops in Britain. In August 1943, she would accomplish a similar mission in the Pacific. She went to one base where German prisoners of war were allowed to watch the movies sitting down in the auditorium, but black troops were standing up. And she protested so that Eisenhower changed some of those policies. In North Africa, the Second Battle of El Alamein opened on the night of 22nd, 23rd of October, 1942, with the first significant British bombardment since the end of the First World War. At last, we had scored a victory. It was as nothing, of course, compared to what was going on on the Eastern Front. But nevertheless, Churchill ordered the bells to be rung in the churches to signal a British victory at last. On November the 8th, Operation Torch, the Allied invasion of French North Africa, began under the command of Dwight D. Eisenhower. The predominance of the US was quite slow to arrive. In North Africa, for example, Montgomery was more successful than Eisenhower was. Eisenhower got a bloody nose then. It was Roosevelt who ultimately made the final decision that they should go into North Africa. And General Marshall was totally against it. He said, if you go in in 1942 to North Africa, you're not going to get to France in 1943. And he actually turned out to be right. On November the 10th, Admiral Francoise Darlan, Vichy High Commissioner in Algiers, ordered an end to resistance to the invasion. That day, Churchill crafted some more of his enduring phrases for the Lord Mayor's luncheon in London, no doubt as painstakingly shaped as all the others. One of his private secretaries found him in the cabinet room late at night, uh, and he said, well, Prime Minister, well, sort of, what are you doing so still working? And he said, I'm just working on some of my spontaneous witticisms. Ah, this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end. Uh, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Nineteen forty three was a year regularly punctuated by conferences, because in the twentieth century, Titans did not lead their armies into battle, they sent them. The first of the year codenamed Symbol, was held in Casablanca in January. Churchill very much resented being the junior partner in the alliance, but was realistic enough to recognize that the, the country that provided the most resources would inevitably start to dictate strategy. Casablanca Conference became really important because it, it promised that there would be a cross-channel attack but not yet. And it meant that Eisenhower would sort Sicily and then climb up the Italian leg. At Casablanca, President Roosevelt said, possibly without consulting his allies, the elimination of German, Japanese, and Italian war power means the unconditional surrender of Germany, Japan, and Italy. It could not be unsaid. There would be no armistice, no truce, no compromise, only unconditional surrender. Hitler was utterly unfazed by his army taking heavy casualties. That didn't worry him at all. He was once given a casualty report which showed very heavy losses on the Eastern Front and his military advisors expected him to be upset. But he just shrugged and said, that's what the young men are there for. General Feldmarschall Friedrich von Paulus saw it differently, and a day after his promotion surrendered his command. 
I have no intention, von Paulus said, of shooting myself for this Bavarian corporal. Hitler called Paulus capture an about face on the threshold of immortality. He was absolutely incandescent with rage. Hitler had fully expected him to commit suicide and thereby retain his honor in Hitler's eyes. He was furious that Paulus had surrendered alive. By May the 6th, Allied forces advancing from the east, linked with the torch invasion and General Alexander, commanding 18th Army Group, was able to signal Churchill, we are masters of the North African shore. On May 14th, Hitler confessed that in Italy, we can rely only on the Duce. When from their positions on the North African shore, the Allies launched the invasion of Sicily on July the 10th, he was proved right. There's nothing like war for turning a populace against its leader. And the highest officials in the land decided to hold a meeting with the king present at which they would remove Mussolini. They voted 19 to 7 to remove him from duty. Such was his level of psychological protection. He created a bubble around him that he went home, went to sleep, and he came back to the office the next morning as though nothing had happened. On the 26th, Benito Mussolini was arrested by the fascist Grand Council. On the 12th of July, 75% of the Red Army's armor and 40% of its manpower was committed to the Battle of Kursk. Panzer General Heinz Guderian said that for Germany, Kursk was a decisive defeat. He described the events of 1943 as the revenge of reality. I'm sure Stalin felt that the Soviets were doing most of the fighting, most of the dying, and that the Allies were trying to minimize their losses. All of the major battles had taken place in the Soviet Union, Moscow, Stalingrad, Kursk, before D-Day. The war was more or less over by then. In mid-August, the Quebec Conference Quadrant further developed Allied planning and was followed by Sextant, the Cairo Conference in November, attended by Roosevelt, Churchill, and Chiang Kai-shek, accompanied by his wife, Sung Mei Ling. Stalin did not attend. Stalin didn't go to the Cairo Conference. The Soviet Union was not formally at war with Japan at this point. It would have been invidious for Stalin to be there talking with Chang about military moves against the Japanese. Sung Mei Ling's role in the Cairo conference was instrumental in ensuring that China got a place at that table. Churchill found Madame Chang most remarkable and charming. Sung Mei Ling had an important role acting as the translator and reinterpreter of Jiang Kai-shek's statements during this meeting. Roosevelt told the Chinese leader that Churchill was his biggest headache. Britain, he said, simply does not want to see China become a power. And Jiang wanted the world. He wanted clear air superiority and undisputed naval superiority and amphibious assault capacity, which of course was totally and completely unacceptable to Churchill. Churchill's physician, Lord Morrow, may have better understood what was going on. To the president, China means 400 million people who are going to count in the world of tomorrow. But Winston thinks only of the color of their skin, Morrow wrote. It is only when he talks of India or China that you remember he is a Victorian. On the last day of the Cairo conference, the Chinese produced 
A draft document would, in effect, ask for the return of Chinese territories that were occupied by the Japanese. That document would be the basis for the Chinese government to claim the sovereignty of Taiwan and for Korea to secure independence. Two days after Cairo, Stalin met Roosevelt and Churchill for the Tehran Conference, the first meeting between the big three. Typically, Stalin organized that the two democratic leaders would have to travel halfway around the world to appear. Stalin is concerned with the Second Front. Where will it take place and when will it take place? He's been asking for this since 1941. Stalin and the Russians were effectively fed up with promises from Churchill of, of jam tomorrow. And it was at this conference that Overlord, the invasion of Europe across the Channel, was decided on. Asked by Molotov which of the two leaders he preferred, Stalin replied, they're both imperialists. Antony Eden, on the other hand, admitted that if I had to pick a negotiating team, Stalin would be my first choice. Roosevelt, I think, had an elevated sense that he could manipulate Stalin. But actually, Stalin was the shrewdest of the three of them when it came to hard-nosed diplomacy. Tehran is interesting because it really shows the extent to which Roosevelt was willing to push Churchill aside. 1943 was certainly the year that Churchill lost control of strategy. By Tehran, Churchill's British bulldog had lost both its bark and its bite. The sheer weight of the other two members of the Grand Coalition had become an inescapable truth. Roosevelt recognized that the two emerging superpowers, if you will, that were going to come out of the Second World War were going to be the United States and the Soviet Union. To mirror what was happening in Tehran, Prime Minister Tojo convened the Greater East Asia Conference, attended by Shang Jinhui, Prime Minister of Manchukuo, Wang Jingwei, head of the reorganized National Government of China, Ba Moore from Burma, Subhas Chandra Bose from India, Jose Lorel from the Philippines, and Prince Won Wait Iacon from Thailand. Not quite a puppet show, but almost. Designed to be a strong statement against colonialism, the proceedings were in English, the common language of the participants. An armistice signed on the 3rd of September meant that Italy, although still a battlefield, was no longer at war. Mussolini, the first titan to fall, was meanwhile being moved from one hiding place to another. Eventually, the Germans had a commando rescue operation from a mountaintop, and they took Mussolini into German custody, and from there, he was put in charge of the puppet state, the Republic of Salo. An American fact-finding mission was meanwhile assessing a controversial leader-in-waiting, Mao Zedong. The young U.S. diplomats, they believed that Mao was a nationalist, was an agrarian, revolutionary reformers. He impressed them, and he hoped that this would continue with American aid and American support. While Mao was promoting himself as a titan, Hitler withdrew from the public eye. His last major broadcast speech was in November 1943. His last public speech 
at a meeting of industrial leaders on July 4th, 1944. Hardly any applause, noted Albert Speer. Goebbels was increasingly frustrated that Hitler wouldn't speak to the people, would not make an effort to reassure them, would not, for instance, visit cities that had been bombed to try to comfort the survivors, which might have been an effective thing to do for propaganda reasons. There's a remarkable line in Goebbels' diary later in the war where he writes, we don't just have a leadership problem, we have a leader problem. In January 1944, and despite losses of four and a half million, German armed forces were at their greatest strength with nine and a half million under arms. Except that strength and a head count are not the same thing, for these were not the best of the crop. They were not battle-hardened or experienced soldiers. In June, they faced the second front. On June 5th, Churchill asked his wife, do you realize that by the time you wake up in the morning, 20,000 may have been killed? Churchill certainly suffered from depression during the war years, especially after the defeats and reverses of, of the first two years. His depression and drinking led to arguments, even with his own chiefs of staff. On the 5th, after a weather delay and acting on the assurance of his meteorologists, Eisenhower gave the go-ahead. And, I hope to God I know what I'm doing, he said. Overlord offered Hitler his last, just credible opportunity of the war to turn the tide against the Allies. He had a scenario, not a very convincing one, but just possible, whereby if he could throw the Allies back into the sea, then he could shift all his important forces, above all the panzer divisions, back to the Eastern Front, smash the Russians, and then come and deal with the Americans, the British, at leisure. Some of those landing in Normandy were returning home. Their leader broadcast from London. For the sons of France, Charles de Gaulle said, the simple and sacred duty is to fight the enemy by all means available, which is not what they'd been doing. But they would conspire with de Gaulle to create an acceptable history. There's a complicity between de Gaulle and the French people. The French people choose to behave as if they believe the Gaullist myth and de Gaulle chooses to behave as if he believed the resistance myth. De Gaulle's demeanor created friction and antagonism, which was to color his post-war conduct. Roosevelt, on a sort of visceral level, dislikes de Gaulle and finds him a disagreeable person. So he provokes all these famous boutades from Winston Churchill. Churchill says he has all the stiffness of a poker without its occasional moments of warmth. He knows he's playing a game of bluff in which he has no real strength. Less than three weeks after the Normandy landing, the Red Army launched its summer offensive. Operation Bagration involved on the Soviet side 1,670,000 men, 6,000 tanks and self-propelled guns, 30,000 artillery pieces, and 7,500 aircraft on a north-south front of more than 1,200 kilometers. During the 10 months from July to unconditional surrender in May 1945, more Germans would be killed than had been in the years 1939 to 44 inclusive. A month after Bagration was launched, Hitler survived the notorious bomb plot and broadcast on the radio, 
In order that you should hear my voice, he said, and so that you should know of a crime unparalleled in German history. I think it's actually very little known how absent Hitler was from the public sphere in Germany during the Second World War. From 1941 through to December 1944, he was almost entirely in this huge set of concrete bunkers in East Prussia, known as the, the Wolfschanze or the, the Wolf's Lair. Then Goebbels, stirring his audience with a call to total war, finds a way of offering hope. The Miracle Weapons campaign was really quite extraordinary. Suddenly, Goebbels bought this rabbit out of a hat that we have the scientific and technological superiority which will win the war. These are going to send the Allies deranged. And of course, they were remarkable. They were the V1, the V2. But the Germans knew they could not wait for wonder weapons and launched a desperate offensive. Operation Autumn Mist, they called it. The Allies know it as the Battle of the Bulge. Eisenhower reacted swiftly, drawing armored formations to the flank of the attack, where they blocked and frustrated the German advance. After the Battle of the Bulge failed in the German part, the end is nigh. It's evident in his broadcast that he's, in effect, given up. And Germans said, that's not my Führer speaking. As the infantry drew closer to German soil, Hitler withdrew completely. Hitler's health was terrible. He was slowly being poisoned by his quack doctor, Dr. Morell, who'd created a huge enterprise on the back of Hitler, so you could buy all these Morell pills. But he was a quack. He didn't want to be associated with defeat, with decline, with failure. And so he was extremely unwilling to, to make speeches. On September 11th, US patrols crossed the German border near Aachen. The second Quebec conference opened the following day. And on September 23rd, FDR launched his campaign for an unprecedented fourth term. There's no question in my mind that Roosevelt understood that he had serious health issues in 1944. Roosevelt's exhausted. Um, he's just trying to hang on. I think uh, his goal at that point was to get re-elected so he could see the war through to its conclusion. During October, Roosevelt campaigned in wet and chilly weather in an open car to squash rumors that he was in poor health. On November 7th, with Harry Truman as his running mate, he was elected for the fourth time. In the Asia Pacific theater, the fatal turning point had been reached in July with the fall of an island of only 115 square kilometers. というのは東条はこの裁判とこそ日本を守るための防衛ラインの中心なんだっていうことを強調してきました。だから絶対ここは落ちないんだと陥落しないんだということを国民にですね豪語してたんですね。ところがこの裁判とが陥落してしまってその
and who did not really make any plausible attempt to do so. The war moved towards its climax. A new world was about to be made. Those titans who would play a part were not all center stage, but they were on the move. 